who? <laughs> Ah, uh, even my voice cracked. <laughs> I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> Hold on, I'll, I'll go back a second. I'll put the subtitles because, you know, I'm a foreigner. Because he's number four, but most people don't even know him. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Let's put things straight. So oh! <laughs> Black Hannibal! Metatron would go nuts! Hi and welcome to History Legends. In this video, we'll do a step-by-step -step breakdown of a video called Top 10 Generals According to Math by a channel called The Mighty One. Great channel, don't forget to subscribe to them. And honestly, ranking generals is fun, we've all done it. But honestly, it's so hard. To me personally, the biggest problem is ranking generals from completely different time periods. But really, how can you compare Alexander the Great with Rommel? And I'm pretty curious to see what metric they base their ranking on. A big thank you to all my patrons for sponsoring this video. If you want to help, link is in the description. Are you ready? Let's jump right in. Someone went and moneyballed military history. Ethan Arsht applied the principles of baseball saber metrics to the performances of history's greatest generals. Of Wait, so he compared baseball metrics with military stuff. I'm pretty curious. Ability to win battles, and he came up with a list of the 10 best generals of all time. The math is tricky, but the list is definitive. There are just a few caveats. Although an imperfect source, Arsht compiled Wikipedia data from 3,580 battles and 6,000... You know, a lot of people say Wikipedia is not a good source, but think about it. You just have to go at the bottom of any Wikipedia page and you have a ton of other sources. And the good thing about it is that you can click from one link to another. If they mention a general, you can click on that general that mentions another battle. You go to that battle and just like that, I entered the rabbit hole of the Latin American Wars of Independence, went from one battle and that was it. <laughs> My idea was to learn a language with something you enjoy and <laughs> spend so much time in it. And the worst, I have nobody to talk to about these things. <laughs> anyway. And 619 generals. He then compiled lists of key commanders, and of course the army. I hope he's there. The general's forces were categorized and his numerical advantage or disadvantage weighted to reflect tactical ability. The real power is ranking the general's Waterloo. force score. Great movie. Above replacement. The more battles... Let me know in the comment section if you want me to react to the movie Waterloo. I... Actually, I already did one video about that movie, but you guys didn't seem that interested in it, so we'll see. As the commander fought and won, the more opportunities to raise their scores. But George Washington. Didn't necessarily help. Uh, quick pause before we continue. I don't remember the name of that show, but back in the days, there was an American TV show that compared generals, but basically they would compare, for example, George Washington and Napoleon and using some sort of metrics they would check the performance of what weapon George Washington's army would use compared to what the French would use. They, they would do tests like that, and it was fun and jokes, but at the end of every episode, they would reenact a battle, and it was so silly. You, you had like 10 guys versus 10 guys, and the last man standing would be the winner of the battle. They had the nerves to say that George Washington was a better general than Napoleon. Yeah. Knowing that George Washington, what, lost half his battles? Anyway, I, I hope this algorithm will be different. There were some surprises in the model, like the apparent failures of generals like Robert E. Lee. For more modern generals like Patton, who didn't make the top 10. What? Relatively... Patton didn't make it. Whoa. But it's kind of normal because, once again, how many battles did Patton fight in it's not your typical set piece battle like in medieval era or before that so yeah that's the problem of these rankings what do you consider to be a battle what's the scope yeah a small number of battles commanded attributed to their absence for more about arsh's results responses to criticism and his findings check out our website in the link below remember Okay, I'll check their algorithm. Just quickly, I'll just check what they mean. Okay, so the indicator is called war. Wins above replacement. I'm not a baseball expert at all, so this is totally new to me. Okay, I'm reading and it says there is a bias favoring players from earlier eras. Interesting. Because there was greater variance in skill levels at the time. 
so the best players were further from the average than they are now. Interesting. It's funny how, just like in baseball and in history, there, there is a bias with ancient times. They tend to penalize a player when his team is better than the other. And just by reading this, it's weird because what if the team is actually better because of that guy? But overall, what I see from the war indicator... So you have a player. If the replacement is not as good as the original player, the war will be increased for the original player. That means that if nobody can replace you, you are a better player. Okay, talking about that, it just makes me think of Napoleon. Basically, this is what coalition forces did starting 1812. Whenever Napoleon was in charge, they would avoid battle and attack his generals. So Napoleon would have a great war score because the people replacing him were not as good as him. Anyway, enough talking, let's go. This has nothing to do with overall strategy and it's all in good fun. So yeah, it's fun. It At the end of the day, it's just a okay, ranking. Let's get started. I did so many rankings on TikTok and it's just fun, you know. People get mad. I understand why they would get mad. But at the end of the day, it's just a ranking. Number 10. Alexander the Great. Alexander was born in 356 BCE and he would go on to create one of the largest empires in the ancient world. He earned his first victory in battle at the age of 16 and became the king of Macedonia at the age of 20. Alexander Wait, what battle did he win at 16? Um, is it the battle of um, Caroni or something? He wasn't alone, there was his father. He was a great strategist. In fact, he won every battle that he himself commanded. That's true. But since his life was cut short and he had only nine battles from which to draw data, it leaves the model very little to work with. Still, the conqueror of the known world is ranked much higher than other leaders with similar numbers, including the Japanese shogun Tokugawa, German field marshal Erwin Rommel, and Confederate General J.E. <laughs> no way! <laughs> they actually compared Rommel and <laughs> Alexander the Great. <laughs> oh my god, the odds! B. Stewart. It should be noted that Alexander's per battle war average is higher than anyone else's on this list. Wow. So yeah, Alexander the Great, I think he should be on that list because every other great general in history mentions Alexander as one of the best. I would have wished they talk at least a couple words about his father, Philip II of Macedon, who basically was the one who formed the Macedonian army. So Alexander grew up with an army and he could launch his campaigns with a, an army that was already a deadly weapon to start with. Number nine, Georgi Shukov. Zhukov, Georgi yeah. Konstantinovich Shukov is perhaps the most acclaimed Soviet commander from World War II. His victory at the Battle of Kursk, the largest tank battle in history, is remembered as the turning point in the war against the Germans. I mean, he's also famous for, he's mainly famous for other battles like Moscow, Stalingrad, and Halkingol in uh, Mongolia. And his assault against Berlin in 1945, mm -hmm. he said, end of the war. Shukov has only one more battle than Alexander, and his overall score barely squeaks by the Macedonian. Interestingly enough, his score is far, far above that of General Douglas MacArthur or Confederate Generals Jubal Early and John Bell. <laughs> who? <laughs> uh, even my voice cracked. <laughs> I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> Hold on, I'll, I'll go back a second. I'll put the subtitles because, you know, I'm a foreigner. Interestingly enough, his score is far, far above that of General Douglas MacArthur or Confederate Generals Jubal... Jubal Early? Who the hell is that? Actually, I'll leave the subtitles. But again, uh, Jukov, yeah, is a great general, but at the same time, he had unlimited human potential and unlimited equipment, which Alexander did not have. Alexander could not lose a 100,000 soldiers and come back with a new army, which Zhukov could do. However, the, the thing that makes Zhukov great is that he was the only one that basically managed to stop the Germans. And he, he saved the Soviet Union. And there were a lot of other Soviet generals, but he was the only one that actually could inflict a severe defeat to the Germans. However, at Korsk, what I, I wish they would have said, I mean, there's only so much you can say, is that he asked the the Stavka, the Soviet Supreme High Command, to stay on the defensive and not attack the Germans. Let the Germans weaken their forces and then launch a counteroffensive. And the other thing is hard to compare Zhukov with, for example, MacArthur. MacArthur only commanded an army. Zhukov commanded several armies. Well, early in John Bell Hood. 
that's what overcoming the odds does for your war score. Number eight, Frederick the Great. Oh yeah. Frederick II ruled Prussia. Napoleon thought that Frederick the Great was one of the best generals of, of his time. Actually, you know what? What would be a good ranking? The best generals in history according to other great generals. Let me know in the comment section if that would interest you. A powerful kingdom within the Germanic Empire during the 18th century. His military prowess expanded Prussian lands and his political influence brought Prussia to the front of European affairs. True. Ruling for more than 40 years. Before him, Prussia was such a little insignificant state in Europe, like nobody took them seriously and he put them on the map. And commanding troops in some 14 battles across Europe earned the enlightened Prussian ruler the number eight spot on this list. His per- Oh, talking about enlightened, it's funny. He, Frederick the Great spoke French. He wrote, I think most of his memoirs in French, but he hated the French. Fun fact, it's funny. Her battle average was also lower than Alexander's, but on the whole, he was just a better tactician. Okay, better tactician. Come on, like, it's true that at Rosbach and Leuten, he really had good tactical skills, but it also relied heavily on luck. Like Frederick the Great was a poker player. He doubled down all the time. And sometimes his bets would end disastrously, like at Kudersdorf. And what few people know is that he wasn't alone deciding in his battles. And thankfully, he had very good generals by his side to, to kind of stop him when he went overboard. For example, he had a lot of older, capable, experimented commanders like Anhalt Dessau. Um, you had Lewald, Schwerin, who saved Frederick's life at the Battle of Molwitz. And then you had also younger generals, the younger generation like Seidlitz, who also saved Frederick at Malwitz by launching a, an opportunistic cavalry charge that stopped the enemy. And nobody seems to talk about Frederick's older brother, Henry, the Prince of Prussia, who was also an excellent general. With the rent done, with that being said, the, what makes Frederick the Great a, a great tactician is that more than a tactician, it was on the operational level that he was good. For example, he would quickly bring his army to hit the French in the west and march his army to the east to face another army. That way the French and Austrian forces would never be able to actually regroup and he would defeat them in detail. Something that Napoleon would learn and apply to even great extent. Number 7. Ulysses S. Grant Yeah. Ulysses S. Grant he should led be there. the Union Army to victory during the American Civil War and went on to serve as President of the United States from 1869 to 1877. Grant's performance commanded... Hold on. How many Americans went from being generals to presidents? There is George Washington. There is Grant. Who else? There is Eisenhower. Um, oh yeah, there's also uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Is that it? Let me know in the comment section if I, I missed and forgot uh, anyone. Any Union troops in 16 battles earned him the seventh spot on this list, as well as the U.S. presidency. Although his performance on the battlefield is clearly much better than those of his contemporaries, mm -hmm. it should be noted that... Yeah, because before he arrived, uh, Union commanders were trash. And the worst is that they meant, well, they all wanted to copy Napoleon art of war, but by doing that, without the skill and the good generals that Napoleon had, it always turned to nightmare scenarios. The generals before him, they all tried to be too smart, better tacticians, do overcomplicated maneuvers. And this is, in a way, what allowed sudden generals to prevail in the, in the early years. So when he came in, he said, enough. <laughs> he put the base and started a new strategy, a more operational, strategic vision of the war instead of just thinking of how to win one battle after the other. In a way, I consider Grant to be one of the first modern generals. Just because of this bigger vision of using logistics, transportation, and not only about winning battles. So the goal was to win the, the campaign. Now that I think about it, Zhukov is very similar to Grant. That his Civil War arch rival, Robert E. Lee, is so far below him on the list that he actually has a negative score. Yeah, I mean, I mean, people like uh, 
spoiler, but the problem of Lee was exactly what I told you before. He had this vision of winning battles, but not necessarily winning a campaign. He didn't understand what were the strategic motives. And also talking about Lee, we have to talk about General Jackson, who helped him a lot. General Jackson saved Lee at multiple times. And the fact that he wasn't there in the later years had a profound impact on the Confederacy for sure. Basically, what makes Grant a, a great general is that he decided to bleed the Southern Army. For Grant, for example, you have to talk about the Vicksburg campaign, one of the, the first, again, modern amphibious campaign in history. And once he went to the Eastern Theater, he decided to bleed the Southern Army. He wouldn't try to be a better tactician. He would just charge head on. But he knew that the Union could replace every man he lost but that was not the case for the Confederacy. So even if the battles were on a tactical level a draw, Lee had no other choice but to keep retreating. Grant would throw one punch after the other and the Southern Army, the Confederate forces could never actually recover. So that was it. Oh yeah, and basically that handed the Union the initiative for the rest of the war. Number six, Hannibal Barkin. Hannibal, Hannibal is notoriously for sure. considered one of the greatest military strategists of all time. Oh! <laughs> Black Hannibal! Metatron would go nuts! I actually want him to react to Black Hannibal. Please tag him below. And that's not in the mean way. I love Metatron's content, especially regarding stuff like that. So I want him to react to that. But yeah, a lot of people, they say, oh, Hannibal, Tunisia, Africa, we we'll put a, a Black Hannibal, but... Okay, there's noise in the back. I don't know if you can hear. But yeah, Carthaginians were actually a mix of Phoenicians and Amazigh people that we call the Berbers. If you've seen them, they're pretty fair skin. And not too different from what the Romans would have looked like. And the greatest enemy Rome ever faced. No, that's true. Born in 247 BCE, he was a general of ancient Carthage, known for his Carthage. conquest of Hispania, the Second Punic War, and the Roman Seleucid War. Okay, you know this is a bad documentary when you see stuff like that when you have like these soldiers spread out and fighting individual battles and, and you actually have hannibal fighting <laughs> alone against a, a couple of romans to of yourself no. like come on how, how are you supposed to take this seriously known for his conquest of hispania the second punic war and the roman seleucid war hannibal once captured by however Sinai, this show if you have to watch one this is an old bbc show about Hannibal, honestly, one of the best I've ever seen. I, I actually miss the old history stuff from the BBC before they turned like woke. Like this was great. If in the future I want to do a movie, I'll do something like that, like some sort of movie documentary and rewatch this and it never gets old. And they actually properly show the battles. He's believed to have given his own ranking system to Scipio once the two started talking. His personal assessment wasn't far off from the truth. He listed Alexander the Great and himself as best, <laughs> both of whom are- But you see the ego of Hannibal too, and like high ego. However, Scipio for me is also a great general. But before I talk about Scipio, there was a lot of Hannibal's work that I, I wasn't even aware of. And I learned through a history channel called History March. Excellent series about Hannibal, highly recommend it. Because we always see the bigger battles, but when you see at everything he had to deal with, you, you kind of understand why he's a great general and how Carthage kind of let him down. That's a huge other theory, but basically what many people believe is that the Carthaginian elite was kind of jealous of Hannibal and they didn't want him to win in the end. They were kind of scared that if he came back as a winner, he would take the throne and kick them out. Long story short. But Scipio now, he's also a great general and there was also other YouTube channels that, that talked about his campaigns and... Come on, the campaign he did in Spain was magnificent. Just the way, just look up the way how he captured the city of New Carthage in Spain and you'll understand th the skill of this guy. In the top 10, even centuries later. Number five, Khalid ibn al-Walid. Oh yeah. He was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad in one of the Islamic empires. If I'm not mistaken, he actually fought against him at the beginning and then joined him and became his best general. ...his most capable military commanders. His leadership united Arabia under a single leader for the first time in history. That's true. He's known for commanding the forces of the Rashidun army under Muhammad and his successors of the Rashidun Caliphate. 
It's rumored that he fought in over 100 conflicts and skirmishes, but he's best remembered for 14. Yeah, it also depends what you consider a battle, right? So 50 guys against 50, is that a battle when you compare it to 50,000 versus 50,000? Because think about it, in ancient Arabia, there was not that many people. So a lot of the battles were in a very small scale cavalry skirmish, basically. Significant battles in which he remained undefeated against the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Persians mm -hmm. and helped spread Islam to the greater Middle East. Yeah, I mean, uh, by the way, it's funny how they, they portray the, the Byzantine Romans with this very ancient Roman uniform from what, the year 100, when this took place in the year six seven hundred typical but one thing we have to talk about when we talk about Khalid ibn al-Walid is that he he fought at the right moment in history so he managed to destroy both the Byzantine armies and the Persian ones but what a lot of people forget is that the Byzantine and the Persian empires had just finished a what 20 30 years war they lost so many soldiers among the best soldiers they had the best generals both empires were done and this is when you had Muhammad and the Muslim forces that went in and destroyed both of them. Compared to others who fought similar numbers of battles, Look, Roman uniform. eclipses even Frederick the Great. Number four, Takeda Singe. Being one of the oh. best military minds in feudal Japan is really a big deal because... Oh. Whenever I see the Takeda clan, Shogun 2. Like, Shogun 2, the Takeda clan and their cavalry, just epic. Almost everyone seemed to be a military mind, and being better than someone else might mean you get challenged to a duel. After 18 battles, the Tiger of Kai reigned supreme. In Japan, anyway. During the 14th century, Takeda Singen was a prominent daimyo, or feudal lord. Wait. 14th century? 14th century, and they have arquebuses. Nah. Hold on, I I'll just check. Okay, got it. Takeda Singen. Okay, 16th century. That's what I thought. 16th century. Now for his military prowess and aggressive Oh, by the way, you see how they have arquebuses? I have a real hard time with that word in English. This is why I got mad at the movie The Last Samurai. Like, they all have bows and arrows, as if they didn't know what firearms were, but their ancestors clearly used them a lot. And anyone interested in military history should know at least a little bit about the Sengoku period. It, it's fascinating. Prowess and aggressive tactics in battle. His domestic policy. And look at all the, the colors and the banners. Taxation and administration were later incorporated into the shogunate. What made him a great general? Do not mention in his tactics or something like. I'm just curious. And I know there was another general that was very good. It was. Okay, I cheated. I looked on my phone, but Oda Nobunaga. So if you know, comment below. I would love to, to hear what you have to say. Because he's number four, but most people don't even know him. Number three, Arthur Wellesley. Ah, oh, of course. Wellesley. Though he would become prime minister, Wellesley is best known for his military accolades. It's a pretty big deal to be the... The British love to put this guy as even better than Napoleon, even though they, they can't be compared. The guy who delivered a solid defeat to the man they call Master of Europe. Ah, uh, you see? Napoleon's old nemesis. The Duke of Wellington commanded famous victories during the Napoleonic Wars, including the defeat of Bonaparte at Waterloo. Like okay. Takeda Singen, his nearest challenger on this list, the Duke saw command of 18... Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Let's put things straight. Even here, the defeat of Bonaparte at Waterloo. First of all, it's Napoleon by that time and not Bonaparte. But it was pure luck. Pure, pure luck. The way he prepared against Napoleon's campaign in 1815, just disastrous. He did not prepare. When Napoleon attacked, he was at a ball with his generals dancing around with ladies. He did not expect Napoleon to attack. And had it not been for the Prussians that halted Napoleon, Wellington would have got clapped. However, had Blucher not been there, then it would have been a complete different scenario. The Prussians didn't have to go back to help Wellington, but they still did but what i learned is that wellington promised the prussians that if napoleon attacked he would help them guess what he didn't help them and they got obliterated by napoleon the prussians could have been like you know what screw you wellington we're going home a uh, little uh, south park joke but the prussians were like you know what we have to help our allies and end napoleon once and for all went back to waterloo helped defeat napoleon and that was it 
even in Spain, it took him three years to achieve what Napoleon did in one campaign. Knowing that Wellington had more men, better logistics, and Spanish guerrillas attacking French supply lines. So he's definitely a good general, and we should definitely talk about him. But is he the, the greatest? Should he be on the top three? Nah, nah, don't, don't BS. Unless this ranking is only based on luck, we might be onto something. Apart at Waterloo. Like Takeda Singen, his nearest challenger on this list, the Duke saw command of 18 battles, but his war score is considerably higher. Number two, Julius Caesar. Kid. Before he declared himself dictator for life and found himself in Honestly, how can you compare Julius Caesar and Wellington? Like again. Infamously murdered by all of his friends, Julius Caesar expanded yeah. the Roman Republic through conquests across modern Europe. Caesar didn't have command in as many battles as Singen or the Duke of Wellington, but his war score reflects a lot more risk and shrewdness in his battlefield tactics. But yeah. even Caesar but yeah, one thing about Caesar that nobody talks about is that not only did he fight the Gauls, but he also fought against Germanic tribes. He also fought in Britain. So you see a lot of different people. And then he even fought against other Roman armies with the same standards, the same ability as his own army. And he fought them in Greece, in Spain, in North Africa, a ton of battles that most people simply ignore. So what makes Julius Caesar a great general is the variety of battles he, he fought in and that he won. When you think about it, Wellington only fought the French army. Wellington kind of knew how the French would react and they would always do the same tactic over and over. It was a good tactic, but lacked a bit of variety. Although I take back what I said, he did fight in India. Number one, oh. Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, yes. okay. You might have guessed by now. But the number one spot belongs to L'Empereur. Napoleon is so far ahead of the normal distribution. I made a reaction to not this TV series that is pure trash. Like I literally don't like it. It's a French European collaboration, pure trash. Like the battles, for example, you have Waterloo and you have uh, 15 guys reenacting Waterloo. Like, come on. Would have been more interesting if you used toy soldiers, honestly, but. Uh, Created by the data for these 6,000 plus generals, it's not even close. After 43 battles, he has a war score of more than 16, which wow. blows the competition. 43 away. battles. There could be no. I think there's even more than 43 battles. But again, these battles were fought against so many enemies in so many different time periods that, of course, it makes him a great general. And at the beginning of his career, he didn't really have that many men. He always fought in a serious numerical disadvantage. Less cavalry, very limited means, very little supply lines. Question. The man responsible for conquering an enormous expanse of Europe during the 19th century is the greatest tactical general of all time. And the math proves it. Yeah, but again, people like Napoleon will highly benefit from the war score because of what we said at the beginning, that nobody managed to replace him. That makes him a better war score general because he also heavily influenced military strategy he influenced warfare in general for example he's the one that created the military unit a division that we still use today in almost every army in the world his restructuration of supply lines that allowed his armies to march at an unprecedented speed again something that we still use today however there's some generals that are known to be in typical rankings that are not there i don't know why but for example there's the mongol general subotai from what i remember he's undefeated and he won a lot of battles against various enemies where is he but anyway let me know in the comment section if there's any other general that you think should be in the top 10 thank you for watching if you're new to this channel don't forget to like and subscribe and if you want to help me produce more videos Make sure to subscribe to my Patreon.